to an electronic evaluation form will be placed in the chat at the end of the presentation. And if you're on the Zoom and you have a question, we're asking that you place those um, in the chat um, and we'll work through those at the end. So I wanted to begin the program with an acknowledgement of the land that we're presenting from. <clears throat> West Virginia University, with its statewide institutional presence, resides on land that includes the ancestral lands of the Shawnee, Cherokee, Lenape, also called Delaware, the Haudenosaunee or Iroquois nations of Seneca, Cayuga, Onondaga, Oneida, Mohawk, Tuscarora, and many other indigenous peoples over time. In acknowledging this, we recognize and appreciate those indigenous nations whose lands we are living on and working in. Indigenous peoples have been in the land currently known as West Virginia since time immemorial. It is important that we understand both the context that has brought our university community to reside on this land and our place within this long history. Thank you. Our program today is part of the West Virginia Feminist Activist Collection Project, an initiative of the West Virginia and Regional History Center. The project is collecting the records and voices of people and organizations who have worked to improve the lives of women in the state. We are especially committed to documenting the stories of people of color, people from the LGBTQ community, and other marginalized groups. Ultimately, these materials and oral history interviews will be open to the public for research and study. They will be used in teaching and learning at WVU and well beyond. In addition to the collecting initiative, the project is also hosting educational programs like our program today. These programs will highlight the importance of archives. It's important to note that this work is being sponsored by the West Virginia Humanities Council and the WVU Humanities Center. Check out the Feminist Activist Collection uh, web uh, site on the History Center's page. Let me open this up for the people in the room who can, so they can see the link too, uh, for more information about the overall project. You can also view recordings of our previous programs uh, West Virginia History Makers, Black Women's Activism in the Archives, as well as Don't Throw It Out, a conversation about documenting women. And I encourage you to check out those videos. Lastly, before I introduce Susan, I also want to mention that today is International Transgender Day of Visibility. WVU's Black Queer Student Coalition has a Zoom event at 7 p.m. this evening, honoring Black trans lives and legacies with Deshaun Harrison. A Zoom link to the program can be found on the WVU Center for Black Culture and Research website. And that's also in the chat. <clears throat> I'd now like to introduce our speaker, Susan Baratinas. Susan is a public history researcher, writer, and consultant specializing in LGBTQ women's history. And she is the author of Interpreting LGBT History at Museums and Historic Sites, which won the 2016 Book Award from the National Council on Public History. Her recent projects include a statewide historic context study of LGBTQ history in Maryland, a historic resource study for the Eleanor Roosevelt National Historic Site, and a National Historic Landmark nomination for the House of the Furies, a lesbian feminist collective in Washington, DC. She holds a Master's of Library Science with an emphasis on special collections and a PhD in US history with an emphasis on gender and sexuality. Without further delay, let me introduce Susan Sparantino. And then you may need to click here first to get started. Hi, everybody. Thank you, Lori, for that uh, introduction. Thank you all for coming out in person. And thank you to the folks on Zoom. I have to be doing a little bit of a dance because I got the webcam and I got the live audience and I've never done a hybrid uh, event before. So we're, we're playing it by ear. But if you find that I am not 
standing in a place that is working for where you're sitting, please feel free to move while I'm talking. Uh, that is no worry to me. So being a public historian, I like to err on the side of accessibility for people that are themselves not trained historians. So with that tendency, I'm going to start at the very beginning, but we'll only be here very briefly. But there seems to be in the wider culture, not necessarily in academia, but a little bit of a question of what professional history actually entails. And so um, let's start there. So a lot of people who um, are only exposed to the profession of history through uh, classes, either at the secondary level or in college as undergraduates, think of history primarily as an effort to understand the broad contours of the past. So that um, there's a certain level of fact, a certain number of facts to be memorized, right? We need to understand what col uh, colonial powers had influence in the formation of the United States, for instance. And we need to know that the Civil War took place in the 1860s, you know, broad outline. But I think a lot of public conception is that it stops there, what historians do. And I, you know, I meet people out in the world who sort of think I memorize historical facts all day, and that is what a historian does. But in fact, as um, I imagine many of you know, that um, once you get those broad outlines of history, you begin asking questions of the past. And each new era has new questions and uh, looks to the past to understand them. And um, that is where historical uh, sources come in, because that is one of the places that we look to ask new questions of the past. And so that's where archivists come in. Um, the task of historians asking these new questions, sometimes that involves approaching known and um, at already accessed historical sources and looking at them with fresh eyes. And sometimes it involves gathering new types of historical evidence to ask new questions. So those of us who work in the field of history and the field of archives understand this given play that there are always new sources to be collecting. There's also new questions to be asked, asking of existing sources or sources that have already been, um, historians have already used to answer other questions. So to some extent, this collecting effort, the collecting aspect of archival work, to some extent involves a little bit of predicting the future, right? You're an archivist in 1928 thinking, what will historians in 2018 be, <laughs> what types of sources are they going to be needing to understand this historical era? So this, as you might imagine, has presented something of a challenge for historians that specialize in LGBTQ history, because um, Historians in 1928 or in 1882 were not necessarily thinking that anyone would be curious about that aspect of the past. James, do you need me to pause or should I just keep going? We're fine. I'm keeping going. Thank you. Whatever you did. <laughs> so, historians of the LGBTQ past actually that's a really big challenge of the work that we do is the lack of historical sources speaking to the questions that we have about same-sex desire and gender variance in the past and part of the resource or part of the reason we have limited resources and here i'm talking 
mostly about traditional archives and I'm talking about mainstream archives. We will quickly get to um, a more nuanced presentation of archives in the, the more recent era, but this is just talking generally about all aspects of the LGBTQ past. So partly, no one was collecting this type of information um, decades ago. It was not seen as historically significant information. It was seen as uh, evidence of criminality and problematic identities. And so it was not necessarily seen as worthy of the art guy. There's also a really heartbreaking reality that many, many of these, um, even if there was someone who had some art guy who was wanting to collect them, and there were a few, like for instance, the Kinsey Institute in Southern Indiana was collecting um, material of sexual variants long before many other people were. There's a few other examples. But um, people destroyed their own papers, or if, for some, if, if, they, if the papers managed to survive the individual's own self-censorship, families often, and going through their deceased relatives' papers, um, found evidence of same-sex attraction or um, gender variance or gender ambivalence and destroyed that evidence thinking it was a taint on that person's historical legacy or historical reputation. So I say this is heartbreaking because at this point, it is almost an indication of a, the need to look further into an archival collection if we know that correspondence between these two very tight, uh, these people in a very tight relationship destroyed their correspondence. And the number of well-known female historical figures who were partnered or very closely aligned with another female historical actor and who, who destroyed correspondence but in that relationship is depressing, is it's an impressive list, but <laughs> depressing in the range of historical figures, such as Jane, or excuse me, Jane Adams, uh, uh, Molly Dews, uh, uh, Romaine Brooks. There's, there it goes on and on of women who appear to have been woman identified in their sexual expression. Had, relation, had what appears to be romantic, if not sexual relationships with other women, but destroyed their correspondence. So it would not, in fact, enter the archives. Another challenge with, and this is in a, in a, um, in a, in decades, uh, this is a historic view of archives. This is not necessarily what is going on in archives contemporarily. But even if something did manage to find its way into the archives, cataloging issues are often a barrier for contemporary historians to access them. One challenge is that con the concepts regarding gender identity and sexual identity are fluid. <laughs> I mean, they're evolving concepts. They reflect the uh, changing society around them. And so some concepts we have now uh, didn't exist in the past or were slightly different. An example of this is when the medical establishment was originally identifying, this is late 19th, early 20th century, when they're originally identifying the theory that instead of just representing behavior, same-sex attraction was actually a characteristic of certain people, and that made them a certain type of person. That was originally understood as under a concept called inversion, and that was sort of kind of complicated, but it's kind of a conflation of 
uh, what we would understand as tra transgender identity and same-sex attraction. And so uh, at the turn of the 20th century, transgender identity and say lesbian identity was not necessarily understood to be two different concepts. They were the same concept. So that makes it very muddy for a 21st century historian who was trying to study one or the other of those things. Likewise, terminology changes. And I'm guessing that most of the folks in the room at least have experience with this, that what we call, what I am calling LGBTQ history was a mere 15 years ago referred to as LGBT or GLBT history. There was LGBTQ, LGBT history. Now it is LGBTQ history and many um, organizations, entities, individuals use LGBTQIA+. So again, <laughs> you know, those do not mean the exact same thing, but um, how do you catalog? Do you use all of those words? What if you were in 2003 and LGBTQ didn't exist as a term at that point? Well, then the catalog is not reflecting that unless you're getting into retrospective cataloging. And finally, if there's a smidge of, let's say, same-sex attraction or gender ambivalence in a collection, it's not necessarily appearing in the archive, or I'm sorry, in the catalog, because in most of the eras since professional archiving, that was not necessarily seen as worthy of cataloging, that it was just this aberration that didn't need to be entered into like the official record of that person that they had an exchange of love letters, say, with a member of the same sex. Um, there's also the instance of archivists not necessarily um, understanding what they're seeing. And that is in part because of the changing concepts. For instance, lesbianism didn't really begin to be applied, the concept of lesbianism didn't really begin to be applied to middle class and wealthy women until the backlash from suffrage in the 1920s. Before that, like essentially like white middle class ladies couldn't be lesbians, <laughs> so they, you know, they were understood to be, um, you know, romantic friends or um, just really close women who spent 40 years sharing the same household. But the sexual component of what that relationship might entail was not recognized. And um, and finally, and I, I kind of, I mean, I'm out of the archives field now, but I kind of feel like this is still an issue. The archivists among us can uh, <laughs> tell me what they think in the question and answer. But how do you catalog something that might be relevant to LGBTQ history if you're not going to name that thing LGBTQ? And I think that is relevant, like those romantic exchanges of letters between women, I would say are without a doubt relevant to the history of same-sex love and desire. But I could understand a, an archivist finding it problematic to call them lesbian content. But like, so how do you flag in a catalog the relevance without applying a label that may or may not be particularly accurate. So that's, that's the end of the mainstream traditional archives conversation. And luckily with regard to the feminist archives is, or at least the second wave of feminism, all of this gets much easier after Stonewall. And Stonewall, of course, the Stonewall uprising was um, the big event in June 1969, um, where uh, gays, lesbians, transgender people uh, fought back 
during a police raid of the Stonewall Inn, which was a gay bar. And um, that is, we're not here today to talk about the history, the full history of LGBTQ activism. So there's a lot of discussion about whether that was, the Stonewall Uprising was indeed the clear cut turning point that it's often presented as. But for our purposes, it's like close enough chronologically to a major shift um, within LGBTQ activism in which um, it's a switch from the homophile movement to the gay liberation movement. The gay liberation movement tended to be more radical. So we're thinking 1970s now. And visibility was a huge part of gay liberation um, political strategy. So they, the gay liberationists were all about um, being public about their sexual and gender identities. And I will say this was a little more of an emphasis on sexual identity at this point, although people that we understand as transgender now were certainly also part of that movement. But this is where you get the concept of coming out to people outside of the LGBTQ community. And it's where you get the concept of what was originally gay pride and now LGBTQ pride. So the idea behind visibility as a political movement was that everybody thinks, or at the time the thinking went, everybody thinks that we are these like aberrant freaks who live in the shadows and like are not functioning members of society. When in fact, we're everywhere and, um, and nobody knows it because we live in hiding except within our own community. And so if people became aware that their loved ones identified as LGBTQ, that huge numbers of people within this population, um, huge numbers compared to those who were already public and out, then it would change the way people thought about giving um, gays, lesbians, at that time, it, that was the emphasis, giving them legal rights. And in fact, it, it kind of seems to have been a very effective strategy because we are in a very different place now than we were in 1970 with regard to that topic. So actually, I love this. The, the meaning of coming out, it existed before Stonewall, but its meaning changed a bit. Previously, coming out came from, um, it was a, a reference in gay male culture referring to the concept of debutante coming out, which was you know back in the day when debutantes came out. And so the use of coming out in the gay male culture meant when someone joined the community, they were sort of coming out like debutantes, announcing their sexual availability and, um, and entering into sort of the adult gay culture. And um, so it existed before Stonewall, but then it changed from being more of an internal term to being the term of coming out to people outside of the community. And um, likewise, pride is all about visibility. And when I'm saying pride, I mean pride events. The fact that June is Pride Month, the Pride Parade, that was all about showing numbers and also safety in numbers. And incidentally, the reason Pride Month is in June is um, in remembrance of the Stonewall Uprising, which took place in June. The first Pride Parade was the Christopher Street Liberation Day Parade held the following year to mark the anniversary of Stonewall. So, I'm not saying it is a direct cause and effect. I'm intrigued by the possibility that it is a direct cause and effect, but at almost simultaneously, 
to this going on in the gay liberation movement, you have lesbians in the second wave feminist movement suddenly demanding that recognition and de demanding that their presence in the women's movement be recognized and that they be visible. And that their concerns be part of feminism agenda. So the picture here is a famous action within uh, second wave feminism that happened in May of 1970. So really less than a year after Stonewall happened, um, lesbians in the women's movement disrupted the now Congress to Unite Women, which was a conference taking place in New York City um, to demand recognition of lesbians and lesbian issues. And they wore, the protesters wore shirts that said lesbian menace, which was a reference to the president of now saying she didn't want to deal with lesbians because they were the lesbian menace. This is a very quick overview for those of you who specialize in this area. But the point that I'm saying is we're getting, we're getting to um, a very interesting thing that's happening in the early 1970s with both gay liberation and the second wave women's movement. And part of this agenda of visibility comes with a desire to uh, for us uh, to reclaim the past, the, the um, predecessors in the past. So you have gay liberationists, not every single one of them, but, but members of that movement taking it upon themselves to research and unearth the queer past. And you have the birth of women's history as a, um, I mean, certainly, there were some historians who were studying women's, the history of women before the, certainly before the 1970s, this started in the 1960s more en masse, but still you have a recognition that if women are important in present day society, they were also important in the past. And, but we don't know anything about that or much about that. And so there's a huge growth of women's history as a subfield. In the official historical profession, it took about 25 more years for LGBTQ history to become a legitimate historical subfield. But it was going on and collecting and grassroots efforts to uncover the queer past were going on just with community members. And, um, and we were so lucky that that happened because a huge amount of what we know about the queer past as well as the past, the past experiences of women come from these, what started out as grassroots efforts. And I must credit the historian, Laura Kellen, for really getting into the relationship between the 60s and 70s um, identity movements and th their efforts to reclaim a path of that community that they identified with. And she, she does that brilliantly in the book, Cleo's Foot Soldiers, which I highly recommend, which I understand some of the uh, history grad students have uh, read. So the very first LGBTQ um, archive, uh, grassroots archive, that I am aware of, that most historians are aware of. So it appears to be the first one. But again, this was all very uh, grassroots. The internet didn't exist. So it's possible an uh, earlier effort will be uncovered. But the first one that is widely acknowledged is the Lesbian History Archive, which is in Brooklyn. It started in 1974. And as I say, that collection is so exciting because in 1974 they were able to access people who had been coming into their adulthood in the 19-teens and 1920s and on up. So there was a capturing of material that would have been lost um, had they not been doing this. There is actually right now a 
I think it came out like maybe two years ago, but it's been a crazy two years. So time kind of stopped. <laughs> but it, there's a new documentary, newish doc documentary about the lesbian history archives called The Archivette, um, which I do recommend if you want to find out more about them. So the next well known, still thriving um, LGBTQ specific archives was also a lesbian archive. It's the Mazer archives, which is kind of the West Coast version of the Lesbian History Archives. The Mazer Archives is now in Los Angeles. It began in 1981 in Oakland. That same year, 1981, you have the well-known LGBTQ archive, the Gerber Hart Library in Chicago is also founded that year. That is um, not a woman-specific archive. Um, and then a few years later in 1985, you have the establishment of the GLBT Historical Society in San Francisco. Now, there's tons of LGBTQ historical collections in archives at this point. And there's many very small community LGBTQ archives, um, often cared for by um, larger historical societies who have a special collection that's been donated to them from a grassroots effort like this. So I'm not saying there are only four places in the United States to find, but, but if you're looking to prance through the, <laughs> the archives and find and just explore to your heart's content, these are uh, four really good places to start. The reclamation of transgender history, um, although they uh, transgender experiences are evident in these other collections, but it's specifically transgender archive movement um, what happened later into the 21st century. You have that. The big transgender archive in North America is the transgender archives at the University of Victoria, which is in British Columbia. And um, I actually don't know when that was founded. They don't have that information on their website, but I believe it was um, a 21st century in the last 20 years. And then much more recently, the Digital Transgender Archive um, Project, which is all digitized, but it's coming out of Northeastern University in Boston. And that started about five years ago in 2016. So um, I digress with all of that name dropping, but for those, of, those who are interested in um, the history of the lesbian feminist archives or in um, learning from the efforts of previous generations. Like those are great places to start. Now, <laughs> so we did the traditional archives and then we did the, the community grassroots, community-based archives. But now I kind of want to combine the two by talking about some of the challenges of, um, of trying to document and share what I would call queer history in, but in forms and disciplines that are already established in a very heteronormative way or in a very hierarchical way or patriarchal way. Because I mean, this applies, I think, to feminists, the second wave feminist movement writ large, both lesbian feminism and other schools of second wave feminism. And I don't work that much in archives anymore, but I work more in historic preservation now. So I'm going to very quickly talk about that national historic landmark I'm working on for the House of the Furies. And, um, and the challenges that come from working with a, fed, a series of federal policies and guidelines that were established in the 1960s, but not out of any super grassroots social movement 
impetus. <laughs> it was more like mainstream 1960s um, policies and pol uh, the policy and um, way that the National Register and National Historic Landmarks are still sort of organized. There's been some adjustments, but it's essentially uh, the master's tools, if you will. <laughs> if you will. Um, and so some of the challenges, and so the House of the Furies is a lesbian feminist collective of 12 women who varied in age from 18 to 28. They did both a lesbian um, living collective where everything, where there was no ownership, everything was divided equally. Um, it was an anti-capitalist experience. It was an anti-patriarchal experience experiment. And as part of this, um, they published a short-lived but very significant newspaper, also called The Furies, which laid the groundwork for a whole lot of the philosophy behind lesbian feminism, which sees uh, heterosexuality as a tool of women's oppression and as kind of the, the um, keystone of uh, patriarchy. And that to truly dismantle patriarchy, women need to stop giving their emotional and sexual energy to men. Again, it gets more complicated, but that's the uh, the big the big picture. And so from here, we see the beginning of lesbian separatism. We see the formation of women's bookstores, a women's economy, uh, the women's music industry. And so it is a very significant um, collective, but it's also a bunch of like very idealistic 20 year olds who quickly imploded. <laughs> and so the period of significance is like 18 months. You know, that, that, yeah, but it's a very important and, and very consequential uh, 18 months. But part of that is like, there's this expectation of a certain amount of gravitas and longevity for something that is truly historically significant. But the social movements of the 60s and 70s were like moving quick and messy, right? There was like this group turned into that group, who turned, you know, and then there was a conflict and they split. And that is all both reality, but also to at some extent, an aspect of the philosophy of the time that, it, uh, that there wasn't a reliance on existing political structures. They were making something new. So there was a lot of um, experiments. So it's been kind of fun doing this National Historic Landmark, both because it's a fascinating history, but also because there's feedback of like, are you sure they, it, there was no more significance beyond the 18 months? Because, uh, you know, and needing to explain that. And then another one is the Furies had three houses, because there were 13 of them. And then one house that is being nominated for a landmark is because that is where the paper was, um, the composite of the paper was laid out and that's where they had editorial meetings. But there, a frequent question I get in the feedback is who lived where? Wait, I'm confused. Like which members lived in that house versus the other houses? And I'm like, it's just as near as I can tell as a historian, it just didn't work that way. <laughs> you know, they owned everything. They, you know, like if you were at this house and you got sleepy, you slept, you woke up, you put on the clothes that were in that room because they shared everything. <laughs> you know, nobody had a specific address at a specific room. And another interesting fact, factor in both the Furies and in part of the problems that uh, led to the Furies implosion is that there were children in the collective. Um, I think two of the women had three, had three children between them, and then there was another child who parents couldn't take care of them, and so sort of unofficially began to live with the Furies, but the Furies had no legal guardianship of that child. But three of those four children lived with the collective, but does that mean they shared child care? Like many of them had chosen not to have children. So that's a whole other um, 
very interesting feminist question that arises, but again, it's not necessarily the usual stuff you see in a National Historic Landmark. So I should say one more thing about the Furies, um, the Furies project, because I think it is relevant to archives, is this idea of significance. Right, and historic preservationists are way more interested in that question, perhaps, than any other uh, subfield of history or public history. But it is a question, right? I mean, ar archivists are just deciding what is worthy of entry into a collection, and it's that question again: like, is does significant if something is significant to LGBTQ history, does that mean it is LGBTQ history, or is can it be significant without um, being itself relevant? And I know that's a little meta, but trust me, I am a very like nuts and bolts person. So if I'm encountering this problem, it's a real like out in the field public history problem. It's not a theoretical <laughs> problem because, for instance. Uh, I just did that statewide historic context study for the state of Maryland. Edgar Allan Poe is from Baltimore, or is most closely associated with Baltimore. There's absolutely no evidence that Edgar Allan Poe was attracted to other men. However, his writings really resonated with, um, with LGBTQ people, particularly gay men. And he was often used as part of the code for people to find other people like themselves without outing themselves to someone who might prove to be dangerous should they know who they really are. So the fact that Poe writes a lot about secrets and people um, not being fully authentic about who they are. He writes a lot about um, like, I mean, what can easily be, easily be called if, uh, homoerotic friendship between men, even if that was not his intention. Or maybe it was, it was a romantic period. But anyway, there's a lot of like gay significance to get out of the writings of Poe. And Poe, I argued, was significant to LGBTQ history because he resonated with LGBTQ culture and hence is historically significant to that story, although he himself was not a member of the community. So again, I mean, it's a kind of a like very theoretical question, but when it comes down to um, truly doing right by the queer ancestors, <laughs> like truly capturing meanings and culture that existed in the past, I think these things are important, but there is also sort of a wider mainstream discomfort with like throwing, throwing folks under the LGBTQ history umbrella who, uh, well, there's a big comfort, discomfort about that for a variety of reasons, which is the subject of another talk. But interesting questions for archivists and public historians to be considering. But getting to this slide, I'm going to conclude with some of my dreams for the Queer Feminist Collection part of the Feminist Archive here at WVU. And, and these are not, these are, these are dreams. They, they are not small tasks or easy tasks that I am bringing up, but I, I dream of an archive and of a historical narrative that can uh, substantively and respectfully engage with internal conflicts, both within the lesbian community, the LGBTQ community, and the feminist community. Substantively engage with the internal conflicts without destroying any hope of a cohesive, accessible historical narrative. Like I said, there's a lot of like, move, like somebody's living there, then they're living here and this group formed and then this group exploded and they came together and formed that group. 
very confusing. But also, I think because of the misogyny, that's my theory, the misogyny that still exists in this culture, I am well aware that very important theoretical debates that happen between female activists are often cast as akin to cat fights. And so petty squabbling that destroys the movement. And that's a tricky line to walk because there was a lot of internal conflict, but so how do we do that? So the photos I chose to illustrate that are two examples of internal conflict. One is issues of race and intersectionality. And the other is a reference to the lesbian sex wars of the 1990s, in which a big debate taking place kind of in the larger women's movement, but definitely within the lesbian feminist movement is the role of sexual expression. Like is feminist porn okay or is that not okay? What about sadomasochism? What about uh, power dynamics, exploring power dynamics in sexual expression between women? Some lesbian feminists were all for that, considered that a feminist project. Others were deeply uncomfortable with it. And it has been remembered partly because of the misogyny, but I must say, I do find it a charming term, the lesbian sex wars of the 1990s. And of course, the big, big, uh, internal debate that is, um, I think, uh, the part of the conversation of the legacy of uh, lesbian feminism is the, the definition of womanhood or the definition of women. Um, in reality, a lot of feminist conflicts, particularly among um, people that weren't heterosexuals had to do with appropriate gender expression. So both femme identities, uh, for those of you unfamiliar with that term, you can kind of look at me, <laughs> uh, a feminine presenting lover of women or butch identities if people were too masculine, butch identities and um, some Northeastern communities of color are more commonly referred to as aggressive, um, aggressive identity instead of butch identity. Um, there was a lot of bisexuality was seen as very problematic for a variety of reasons um, historically. And then of course, as um, trans women, became more organized and more visible. There was a conflict because within women's culture, there was a tradition of women only space, creating safe space for women by having only women there. So when trans women started showing up, that challenged assumptions about what woman only space meant. And that Conflict or debate continues. I mean, it is it is alive and well on Twitter to this very day, and um, and it's a legitimate conversation. I'm not saying there's um, what I am in fact saying is that to actually not simplify these debates and to actually respectfully and substantively get into the the feminist underpinnings of different positions, both in the sex wars and in um, conflicts of intersectionality and conflicts of um, policing, it, what many saw as policing the boundaries of womanhood. Um, that instead of just saying good guys, bad guys, you know, if, if, if there's a way to substantively engage with the, um, with the motivation of different so, I don't know what that ringing is, but luckily I'm, <laughs> I'm finishing up because I had to check that had something to do with that. So, and then just finally, we all know this, but just uh, in due diligence to remind 
everyone involved in the fem feminist archive that uh, trust can should not be assumed. Trust needs to be built and earned, and that outreach to underrepresented communities so that they can have a say in what is important and historically significant to their communities is extremely important. And I do, I am aware that this project is doing that. And that poster there as my illustration is from uh, old, his, my very first, very first community history project in the early 90s. I was involved in capturing the lesbian feminist history of Austin, Texas. And that pretty much all fell under the umbrella of one group, the Austin Lesbian Organization. And as I understand it, it is similar to the Artemis Collective here in West Virginia. And um, as I believe is the plan uh, here at West Virginia University, um, this grassroots group of women capturing this history also hosted a reunion for the women has, who had been involved in that organization. And this is the poster from like 1993 of um, our efforts to advertise that. So with that, I will open it up to questions. And uh, someone is helping me with that. <laughs> Either Lori or me. Where's the House of Furies? Ooh, I am so sorry, I didn't mention that. The House of the Furies is in Capitol Hill uh, in Washington, D.C. And um, it is actually already on the National Register, thanks to um, a member of the Rainbow History Project, which is the grassroots LGBTQ history project in Washington, D.C. And their collection, as I was, talk I was talking about generally, Rainbow History Collection is housed at the DC Historical Society, you know, so that it is climate controlled and it is like in the larger catalog where people might be looking for that history. So yeah, so it's in DC and DC has an interesting structure for preserving their LGBTQ history, which is great because there's a lot of it in DC. <laughs> Very quickly, I'll also say that the DC Public Library has a big digitization project. It's called Big DC or Dig DC, Dig. But they have digitized the Washington Blade, which was a pretty significant LGBTQ paper. It still exists. And so that is something of a historical archival treasure trove um, for, for folks looking for LGBTQ historical sources. Thank you. Thank you. Anything in the different questions. So I'll, I'll approach both of them. I apologize, I forgot to repeat uh, Barb's question, which was about the location of the House of the Furies. The current question is both about how does one approach a statewide historic context study of LGBTQ history, and then the secondary question of thinking about a local community's LGBTQ history. Where do you start? So with Maryland, it was a work for hire. I was hired to do this work. So we had, you know, as consultants know, they must do, they had, I had a very specific scope of work so that our expectations matched up from the very beginning. This would have been a far longer term and grander project should it have involved a lot of archival research. So basically our approach was to triangulate Maryland history and LGBTQ history and to find the places to look further. So for instance, 
lots of same-sex sexual activity in the maritime industry. Just historically, we know that. And Maryland, lots of maritime history, Port of Baltimore, Naval Academy, et cetera. So, you know, so, so we sort of uh, honed in on that, those areas as likely places to find um, same-sex activity. We also had an intern, library science, uh, master's student who went through the newspapers and now newspapers are digitized now, so it's not like reels and reels of microfilm like it was, was, but still it was a pretty intense effort. But he found stories in the paper and they often had either, at least a neighborhood, if not a specific street address. So that helped us pinpoint something. He in fact, found in a very rural county in Maryland in like the 1880s, um, a couple got married and the parents of the married couple contested it saying they are two women. And they were like, the married couple was like, we don't see it that way. Like, you know, we both see this person as a man. And um, so there was controversy, they had to get unmarried, but they continued to, to they left the state together. And um, that was exciting. You don't find that a lot in the 1880s in rural Maryland. Mm -hmm. And so, but just as an example of like looking through a paper, mm -hmm. it's, it's amazing what you can find. And the house still stood, the family house of the person who identified as male, but his uh, parents said he was female. The house is still there. So that's generally how I did that. The, as far as getting started in a grassroots effort, I think this is a little more true for LGBTQ history, and this is a generalization regardless, but it is probably also true of feminist history. There, there is likely someone in every community who uh, just collects stuff, who doesn't throw stuff out, and who, whether that is inspired by an understanding that this is historically significant, or whether it's just a like, you know, discomfort with waste, um, a lot of times it's it's a matter of identifying that person who is sort of the keeper of the community's history, and. Um, and then building trust with that person. Cause that, in my experience, often this person is personally collecting this information because of a distrust that anyone else will uh, respect it and take care of it. And that is not an unfounded concern. I mean, there's plenty of examples of mainstream institutions not treating LGBTQ folks right so um so that is one place but then again um oral histories of lgbtq elders and um and then newspapers first the newspapers tend to be a little you know it's always like the people that got arrested you know the people that like were being publicly like creating a public scandal at a particular time like it's not happy LGBTQ history necessarily, but it definitely points to, um, to it, it provides visibility and points to the realities of the LGBTQ past. And I would like to throw in a slide that did not seem to completely flow with the talk, but I'm not gonna read all that, but there was, a lot of back and forth about what counted as significant to LGBTQ history in the course of that project. So in my introduction to that historic context study, I, I have this uh, standard, I guess, as the standard I used to determine whether a story or a site or a person should be included in this study. And I know from an outsider, it may seem very quixotic or like overly mushy or something, but LT LGBTQ youth face really bad outcomes. 
right? I mean, statistically, their lives are much harder. They're at much higher risk of suicide. They're at much higher risk of not finishing high school. They're at much higher risk of homelessness, of sexual abuse, and on and on. And uh, the culture as a whole, I feel, is very clearly not doing enough to address what I see as a crisis of um, young people in America. So, you know, call me a romantic if you will, but I really was like, if it's gonna help young people see themselves and find their roots, I'm going to fight to include it as significant. So this was in the Maryland. Yeah. I, it's remarkable. Like I have never seen, you know, in sort of the more technic static writing you see in, in these sorts of, you know, very technical documents that are produced something like that. It's really refreshing to see. Well, I really appreciate that because I was a little sweaty about doing it. <laughs> I was not sure how that was going to play with the preservationists, but yeah. they did not ask me to remove it. Okay. And they allowed me to use it as the guideline for inclusion. So. Wow. Anything from Zoom? Well, that's an interesting thing. There's some wonderful sources that are personal diaries, but something that is sometimes hard to explain, and um, the historians in the room can tell me how effective they feel this argument is or not. But people in the 20th century kind of, it's a, the modern enterprise, like self-reflection and self-gratification are kind of a modern enterprise, right? So like starting in the 1920s, you see people like worried, you know, not uh, unrelated to like the emergence of Freud, but like you see people concerned about sexual gratification and um, happiness, personal happiness and personal satisfaction. And kind of before that, culturally, you have people much more concerned with being, adhering to the moral standards of a group or having a good reputation or following uh, the tenets of their religion. It's very general, but personally, I don't find personal diaries and journals before the World War I today anywhere near as interesting, remembering I'm a historian of sexuality, that to personal writings after that. I think people were just thinking about their lives in a slightly different way. Um, the, a really good example of a use of a diary is the book Jeb and Dash. It's old, it's from like the 1990s but it is basically a reprint of a diary of a civil servant in DC in I think the 20s and 30s who was gay and who wrote about being gay. And, um, but it is actually, you know, you have to think about committing uh, gender ambivalence or same sex desire or same sex be sexual behavior Committing that to writing was equivalent to creating evidence that could be used against you in court or in uh, committing you to a men mental institution. Uh, you know, not to put too fine a point on it, but that is a reason we don't find a lot of, of personal writing anywhere near as much as we would love to have is because it's, um, you know, you don't, it was, it was illegal. It was, Cause it was considered mentally mental illness or sexual perversion to feel these have these experiences to seek these experiences. So uh, people were very reticent <laughs> about committing themselves to um, creating evidence, I guess, to that effect. Anybody else's questions in the room? Carol, I have just a quick one. Um, 
we gave us a long list of like, early archives that were located in this form. You mentioned one in Chicago, and I completely missed the name. The Gerber Hart Library. It's, um, well, I must confess, I don't know who Hart was, but Gerber, um, Henry Gerber was uh, a German immigrant who started the first known gay rights organization in the United States. It was in like, it was in the 1920s. I think it was like 1923, maybe 1927. But he applied to the state of Illinois for like a charter and they granted him a charter. But then again, eight months later, the police raid him and uh, put him in jail. So short-lived, but significant. <laughs> I think so. The reclamation, historical reclamation that I was talking about, um, that was definitely a um, an endeavor by both gay men and lesbians. They tended to not necessarily be collaborating together, <laughs> which is why you have the lesbian history archives beginning first. But um, there, it was true of both groups. I think that something, and I, I am still working on perfecting this argument for my National Historical Landmark nomination, but I think that the current narrative of LGBTQ activism, the standard historical narrative, overemphasizes gay liberation at the expense of lesbian separatism or lesbian feminism. Because the history of gay liberation overwhelmingly is the history of a political movement that was led by gay men. And there was like 10 to 15% of the membership of groups, gay liberation groups, were women. All the rest were men. And I think historically that has sort of been treated as like, huh, like what was going on there? And I think the answer is because, <laughs> because uh, lesbians were involved in lesbian separatism, lesbian feminism, and creating a female economy and a, a women's culture. And uh, then eventually the two movements merged back together um, around the time of uh, the, the AIDS crisis and the, the emergency that caused in the community. But by ignoring lesbian feminism, both in the history of second wave feminism and the history of LGBTQ activism, we have a huge hole in the story. So for the feminist archive project, like we <laughs> should include <laughs> lesbian feminism. So just following up on that, do you think it's because the gay liberation movement was, was much more public for versus creating a community space? Or do you think that's why? Or do you think it was why for this lesbian separatism? Or do you think it's more work on that plus sort of um Gender bias, or what, what do you think is causing the one to sort of outweigh the other? I think that a something that was very exciting about lesbian feminism that ultimately proved to be maybe its greatest weakness was um, its internal focus, was more like. You know, and again, this is broad strokes. This is not, you know, a detailed discussion of, but it was more let us focus on creating a woman centered world um, as opposed to trying to change mainstream society. Mm -hmm. And so I do think that that was, um, so I think perhaps they were less integrated with or less visible. Which I guess is what um, you were asking. Yeah, and I do think that it's part of like 
the men tend to have more resources than women. And so um, like the, the people that were writing the histories, the people that were, were creating uh, coll archival collections of um, activism, like that was perhaps more likely to happen um, among more uh, activists with more resources and hence more time to like devote to their legacy. But you called me on the spot there, so you know, with me in two days, I may have a more nuanced answer. <laughs> okay, so any final questions? Hearing none, thank you so much. Thank you guys. Thank you for having me. Thanks to everybody who is on the Zoom, and uh, we'll try to make this available as soon as possible. Have a great day.